This video is an introduction to the different types of mutation, both in terms of how they arise and what's actually going on with the DNA, and also the effects they have on protein function. Genetic variation arises as a result of mutation, which is random changes to the genetic code. This can occur spontaneously during replication, when it's possible for an incorrect base to be inserted, but the frequency of these mutations can also be increased by exposure to mutagens. So this can include various chemicals, but also things like UV radiation. Mutagens can be split into physical, chemical and biological types. For instance, X-rays and gamma rays can both introduce strand breaks in the DNA. And during the repair process, mutations may be introduced. UV light can cause adjacent thymine or cytosine bases to bond together to form a dimer. And this leads to errors during replication. Deaminating agents such as nitrous acid can turn cytosine into uracil, and this then means that during DNA replication, this is treated as if it were thymine, so an adenine is introduced on the complementary strand rather than a guanine. Clastogens, which are chemicals like benzene and asbestos, can cause deletions, additions and rearrangements, so big chunks of the chromosomes being taken out or moved around. Alkylating agents such as mustard gas can attach methyl groups or ethyl groups to a base, and this can also lead to incorrect base pairing. Base analogues are chemicals which look quite similar to um, traditional DNA nucleotides, and they can be used in place of a base during replication. And then viruses such as the HPV virus are able to insert their own DNA into the genome, and this can also cause the disruption of genes and proper protein production. Not every mutation is intrinsically a bad thing. In fact, the vast majority are selectively neutral to the organism, and this could be for a number of different reasons. The first one is that the mutation may occur somewhere that it doesn't actually affect the protein. For instance, if it lies in a non-coding region. So that could be the introns, the non-coding regions within each gene, or it could be in the large sections of chromosome in between the genes that aren't responsible either for coding for the protein or for controlling how much of that protein is made. The second reason is that we might see what's called a silent mutation. And we'll look at these in more detail in a second, but essentially this means that the sequence of the DNA changes, but it doesn't affect the sequence of the protein. The third reason is that although the sequence of the protein or the polypeptide may change, if that particular amino acid isn't particularly important, either for the folding of the protein or for the interaction of that protein with other molecules, say for instance, it's not part of an enzyme's active site, then it may be possible for the sequence of that protein to change, but for it to not affect its function. And in this case, the mutation is still selectively neutral. Of course, there are plenty of deleterious mutations as well. And this is another word for harmful. So for instance, the classic example would be any mutation that causes cancer. A mutation may cause there to be none of a particular protein made, or it may cause a shorter version of the protein to be made. And it's quite often the case that the back end of that protein is still important, so that shorter end of the protein won't function as well. Or we could have a completely full length protein, but if one particular key amino acid is missing, so for instance, something that's vital for the binding of an enzyme's active site, then that protein just won't work as well. And any of these could be selectively negative for the organism. Finally, there could be a beneficial mutation, but these are much more rare. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that you may have studied at GCSE as an example of a disease that's caused by a recessive mutation. The symptoms include excessive mucus production, both in the respiratory system, which causes difficulties with breathing, and also in the digestive system. It's caused by a deletion of three bases in a cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein. Because those three bases have been deleted, there is one key amino acid missing, and this leads the protein to fold incorrectly. This means that the rest of the cell breaks down that protein, and without it, there's excess mucus production, which affects the lungs of those cystic fibrosis sufferers. There are far fewer nice examples of beneficial mutations. Pretty much the only other one you're likely to have heard of is how having a single copy of the sickle cell anemia allele provides protection against malaria. Now, lactose persistence or lactose tolerance is an interesting example because it's quite a recent mutation, probably occurring in the last five to 10,000 years, certainly since we've domesticated animals and crops and moved to being a more agricultural society rather than hunter gatherers. And it's happened at least a couple of times in distinct populations, both in Northern Europe and also in Pakistan.
Lactose is the sugar that's found in mammal's milk. And in the majority of mammals, when a juvenile reaches adulthood, they stop making the lactase fluorazine hydrolase enzyme, or just lactase for short. And so they lose the ability to digest lactose. However, a couple of different times a mutation has occurred, which causes the lactase promoter to keep working. And so you keep producing lactase and you can carry on drinking milk, either your mother's or a cow's. And for agricultural societies already keeping cows for their meat, that's a pretty big advantage, both because it gives you a good source of calcium compounds, which helps you to avoid osteoporosis, and also just as an additional food source during times of scarcity. Time to pause and check your understanding so far. Can you write down why the majority of mutations do not affect the phenotype of an organism? There are three key points we should consider here. Firstly, the mutation might occur in a non-coding region. Secondly, it might not change the amino acid sequence, so it might be a silent mutation. And finally, it might affect the primary sequence of the peptide, but not be required for proper folding or the functioning of the protein. We've talked about different types of mutation in terms of the effect that they have on the organism, but now we need to look at them in terms of what happens to the DNA. So firstly, we split these into chromosome mutations, which affect a whole big chunk of a chromosome, and point mutations, which affect a single base. Chromosome mutations come in four major types. Firstly, deletions. So this is just what it sounds like if you have a chromosome and you have a whole big chunk of that being deleted and removed. The second one is duplication. So we have a chromosome and it has a particular section that codes for a particular gene, and then that section is introduced again. So it's literally in there twice. Then we have translocation, not to be confused with translocation in plants, where we're talking about substances being moved, um, but where we're talking about a particular section that should be on one chromosome and instead it's moved to a completely different chromosome. And then finally, we have inversion events. And this is where you have a particular piece of DNA and it's been one way around and then it's flipped over so that it's actually the other way around in the chromosome. And this wouldn't be such a big issue if it was happening to an entire gene. But if it's happening to part of a gene, then this is obviously going to have a really disruptive impact on the protein. Then we also have our point mutations. So whereas a chromosome mutation is going to be lots and lots of bases being affected, a point mutation is the alteration of a single base. Point mutations can be split into three further types. So we can have a substitution where instead of the original sequence, one of the bases is swapped for a different one. We can have a deletion where something is removed and we can have an insertion where something is added in. In order for us to understand the impact of these point mutations, it's important that you remember that the DNA is not going to be read as individual bases. It's going to be read in codons. So a codon is a sequence of three bases that codes for an amino acid. So here's one example of a codon, and this particular codon codes for lysine. Now, I could have a substitution where instead of TTC, I have TTT. So my cytosine is replaced by an additional thymine. And that actually still codes for lysine. And this is due to this idea that the genetic code is degenerate. So we have more than one codon coding for each amino acid because we have four different bases and there are three bases in the codon. So we actually have a total of 64 different options available to us. And then actually there are only 20 different amino acids. So even when you include the start codon and a stop codon, there's actually a lot of spare codons. So we have a situation like this where more than one codon codes for the same amino acid. So this is what we call a silent mutation. And this is part of the reason that a lot of mutations don't have an impact on the organism, because even though there's been a change in the DNA, there isn't a change in the protein sequence. Now, our second option here is going to produce a stop codon. And so this is what we call a nonsense mutation. So this is where the protein is going to be artificially truncated. It's going to be shorter than it was supposed to be. And this is usually deleterious unless it's the very end of the protein. And that particular end of the protein is not particularly necessary for its function. Usually a nonsense mutation is going to be negative for the organism. And then we also have an option where we have a different base and this leads to a different amino acid being inserted and this is what we call a missense mutation now missense mutations can be conservative or they can be non-conservative and this is going to affect 
how big the impact is of this mutation. So this mutation is called conservative because both lysine and arginine are positively electrically charged and their R group is basically just a really large alkyl chain with some amine groups on it. So they're quite similar to each other. And so it's quite likely that if this one particular amino acid isn't super vital to the functioning of that protein, then it may be possible for the organism to kind of get away with that change. Whereas um, threonine is very, very different. It's a, a polar group, and so it behaves in a different way to lysine. And so it's likely that having that amino acid substitution is going to impact the way that this protein folds and the way that it interacts with other molecules. To make sure that made sense, pause the video and quickly write down what the difference is between silent mutations, nonsense mutations and missense mutations. So these are all types of point mutation, but a silent mutation has no impact on the protein sequence. And this is because of the degeneracy of codons. In other words, we've changed a base that doesn't affect what amino acid is being inserted. Nonsense mutations produce a short version of the protein, and this is because they have a stop codon included. A missense mutation is where we have an alternative amino acid being substituted instead, and this could be either conservative or non-conservative. While it's true that a significant minority of substitution mutations may have no impact on the organism in which they occur, either because they're truly silent mutations, so they haven't affected the sequence of amino acids at all, or because even though there has been a change in amino acid sequence, this is still selectively neutral because it's just a single amino acid and it happens to be one that hasn't been involved in folding or function of that protein. It's far less likely that an insertion or deletion may occur in the coding region of a particular protein without having a deleterious effect on that organism. In order to understand why, we need to recap how the DNA is used to synthesize protein. So we start off with our DNA sequence, and this is transcribed to make a complementary mRNA sequence. Now, when that mRNA is translated and used to produce a sequence of amino acids, it's not the case that one base codes for one amino acid. Instead, that mRNA needs splitting up into codons, each containing three bases. And each one of those three bases has an amino acid associated with it. Insertions and deletions are particularly tricky because they may lead to what we call a frame shift mutation. When you have a substitution mutation, one base is changed and therefore one amino acid changes. However, if we insert an additional base at the start of this sequence, you can see that this affects all of the amino acids that come after it. It's not just that the methionine at the start has been replaced by asparagine, but actually every codon has shifted along by one. So whereas in the past, this A, T and G were all read together, now they're not. So it, it isn't always the case that if you have an insertion or a deletion that this will lead to a frame shift because we're not always talking about a single base. So for instance, if I inserted three bases or if I deleted nine bases, then that wouldn't lead to a frame shift. And this would probably have a far smaller impact than if we've inserted a single base or two bases. Pause the video here and explain why it is that an insertion is likely to have a greater impact on protein function than a substitution mutation. So the first thing that we need to say is that an insertion is likely to cause a frame shift mutation. It won't always, but if we're adding a number of bases that isn't divisible by three, then that will lead to the codons being read differently. Secondly, this means that all of the downstream amino acids, so all of the amino acids that come after that point, will be affected. And this greatly increases the likelihood that one particular amino acid that is vital for the function of that protein will be hit. In contrast, a substitution is only going to affect one amino acid. And in addition, it may not even affect that one amino acid because it's possible for that mutation to be silent. In addition to classifying mutations based on what impact they have on the DNA and what impact they have on the sequence of amino acids, we may also want to classify them based on their impact on the protein function. Because as we've already seen, particularly for substitution mutations, it's possible for the amino acid sequence to have changed, but actually for the protein to be relatively unaffected if that amino acid is not in a vital place. So we can talk about amorph mutations, which cause loss of function of the protein,
So that could be inserting a stop codon, or it could just be changing one amino acid that is particularly vital, or it could be because there's been a frame shift mutation and the whole back half of the protein is completely garbled. We have hypomorph mutations, which lead to a reduction of function. So this could be because a promoter region has been mutated, or it just could be that the back half of the protein has been changed, but it's only a little bit at the very end of the protein, so it's still able to partially function. Or we can have hypermorph mutations, which lead to gain of function. And as we've said, these are far rarer. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found that a useful tutorial into A-level biology mutation. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to let me know in the comments below and like and subscribe for more A-level biology videos coming soon.